Namaste. So now we have reached to the end of this course and in this module we will be having three revision classes. So the first one is that we had started this course with this introductory module where we had begun with the introduction to the course. We talked about this girl who was living in this particular village and there are so many organisms around and you also have mosquitoes and if there is a spring and all of these organisms are dying. Now that you have gone through this course, we can now come back to this problem and whenever there is a spray of insecticides, so the insecticides do not only kill the insects, but they also remain in the environment. And in this case, if there are some insects, so we saw it in the case of uh, evolutionary biology as well, that whenever you spray any insecticide on an insect population, there will be some organisms that will remain because of the variations that are there in any population. Now, if you have some insects that have been exposed to the insecticides and they are not completely dead, so in that case their bodies are having slight amounts of insecticides and when those insecticides get into the uh, food chains, so at every level you have uh, the accumulation of these chemicals which is known as bioaccumulation and at the same time you also have a magnification of these chemicals which is known as biomagnification and the more you move up in the trophic level the more is the serious consequence. So, it is no wonder that some of the birds that are eating or that are staying at the top of the food chains or at the upper trophic level much more deleterious consequence of these insecticides and they die out. And we had seen that this also is a case that is very prominent in the case of human beings because human beings are also top predators, they also come at the very top of the food webs and they also occupy the very top of the trophic levels and so they are very much exposed to the impacts of different chemicals and pesticides and so on. Uh, then we began with the definition of ecology, oikos is household, logos is a study, so this is the study of, of life at home or the scientific study of interactions among organisms and their environment or the scientific study of interactions that determine the, di the distribution and abundance of organisms. So, in the first case we are talking about interactions, so we are talking about population ecology, community ecology, ecosystem level ecology and we are looking at different interactions. In the second case this definition has more to do with biogeography which is asking where different organisms are and why are they where they are. Then we looked at what all we study in, in ecology, so we have habitat, biodiversity, population level interactions, community level interactions, impacts of different changes and there are these three different approaches to ecology. The theoretical approach which utilizes equations and models, so we have looked at different equations and models throughout this course, the, uh, the most prominent ones are things like the lotka volterra equation which are telling us the, uh, the dynamics between the population of the prey animals and the populations of the predator animals. We also looked at, uh, at different equations of population growth, so we looked at the exponential growth curve, we looked at the logistic models, so those are uh, they belong to the theoretical approach. The second one is the laboratory approach which utilizes the scientific method of formulating hypothesis and testing them through experiments. So, the laboratory approach included things like if you are transplanting an, an organism from one place to another, if you are say looking at uh, the populations of uh, different caterpillars and you are seeing them, uh, them change their colors and so on that we have seen in this particular course. And the third one is through field observations, field observations are things like the langur cheetal association that we also saw in the case of community interactions. So, we have made use of all these three different approaches throughout this course and then there was this outline, assessment, final examination. Then the second lecture was about a historical overview of ecology. Now in this we started with Theophrastus, Theophrastus was a very ancient person, he was a Greek scholar who lived in the pre-Christian era, so from 371 to 287 BC, he is considered the father of botany 
and he was the first one to have described the interrelationships between animals and their environment. So, that forms a bedrock of even our current understanding. He wrote 10 different books and he has uh, done a lot of work in classifying different organisms based on their modes of generation, locality, size and so on. Then we had a look at Carolus Linnaeus who gave us our current system of naming different organisms based on the binomial nomenclature. So, when we say homo sapiens it is derived from Carolus Linnaeus, if we say that a tiger is panthera tigri then that is because of Carolus Linnaeus and so on. And then he also gave us a system of uh, classifying the species. So, all different organisms that are uh, related they come together in a classification. We also looked at Thomas Malthus and we looked at his theories in much more detail when we were talking about the growth of human population. So, here again the most important thing to remember is that the population growth in the case of human beings it is exponential or it goes via uh, geometric progression whereas the food uh, production increases as arithmetic progression. So, there is a mismatch which has to be uh, covered and he talked about different ways of covering that mismatch. Then we talked about Alexander von Humboldt who is considered the father of biogeography and we have devoted quite a lot of attention to biogeography and uh, he performed quite a lot of quantitative work on botanical geography especially in South Americas. Then we have uh, Wallace, Wallace and Darwin who together came up with the theory of evolution and we have looked at theory of evolution in more detail in some of the lectures. So, the we have the theory of evolution and the theory of natural selection. And then we also have Herbert Spencer who coined the term survival of the fittest. Then we have Ernst Haeckel who coined the term ecology, Vladimir Vanatsky who was the first to have thought of biogeochemical cycles and we have looked at biogeochemical cycles in much more detail in one of the lectures. Then we have Arthur Tansley who founded the British Ecological Society, uh, Charles Elton who is called the father of animal ecology and is also a pioneer of the study of invasive organisms and we looked at a number of invasive organisms throughout this course, the most important of which are lantana which we have in our country and things like muzzle that move when you are transporting ships from one place to another. So, they move along with the ballast water that we have seen in detail in the case of biogeography. Then we talked about George Hutchinson who looked at interspecific competition and he also wrote a treatise on limnology. So, interspecies con, uh, competition is something that we have dealt with in great detail in the case of community ecology. Then we have Lotka and Volterra who are famous for the Lotka Volterra equations. Eugene P. Odom who wrote the book Fundamentals of Ecology and then we move to the third lecture which was Ecology and Evolution. In this lecture we began with the definitions of ecology and evolution. So, ecology is the scientific study of interactions among organisms and their environment and evolution is the genetic adaptation of organisms to their environment. So, we looked at this term genetic adaptation. So, adaptation is any alteration in the structure or function of an organism by which the organism becomes better able to survive and multiply in its environment. Genetic refers to something that is related to genes and genetic adaptation is inheritable fitness. So, fitness has got little meaning if it is not heritable. So, if you are a fit organism then your offsprings should also carry this trait forward uh, which would leave, lead to final evolution of the species. And we define fitness as the ability of a particular organism to leave descendants in the future generations relative to the other organisms. And evolution acts to maximize fitness through the process of natural selection. So, whenever we are talking about evolution it is maximizing the fitness. So, you are selecting those organisms that are more fit as compared to the other organisms. So, those organisms that are say better able to move, better able to get their food, better able to find their mates or those organisms that are able to devote time to their offsprings, they are getting food for their offspring, they are protecting their offspring, those are the organisms that are more fit as compared to uh, as uh, described in this definition and evolution tends to select for 
those particular organisms. Then uh, we looked at different characteristics. So, fitness is environment specific. If there is a change in the environment, the organisms that are fit today might not remain fit in the future. It is species specific, uh, just high reproductive rate is not good enough. You have to make sure that your, certain, your progeny also survives. Then fitness has to be measured across several generation. It is a long term measure and it works at the level of the complete organism, not on just some individual traits such as size or speed. So, if we see that there is one tiger that is say larger in size or this tiger is faster than other tigers that does not mean that this tiger will be more fit because it is a combination of all different traits and fitness is measured at the level of the organism not at the level of specific traits. Then natural selection is the process in nature by which only those organisms that are best adapted to their environment tend to survive and transmit their genetic characteristics to the succeeding generations, while those that are less adapted tend to be eliminated. So, essentially when we say natural selection, so those organisms that are most fit they survive, those organisms that are less fit they die out, which is why we also term it as survival of the fittest. Then there are 5 steps in natural selection, it begins with variation. So, every uh, so different individuals in a population are different, they have different characteristics. We looked at paper moth, which has two different colors. Then uh, there is overpopulation, so organisms tend to produce an excess number of offsprings. Because you have excess number of offsprings, there is a struggle for existence because not everybody will be able to get enough resources to survive and for their progeny to survive. So, there are more organisms, less resources. So, there will be a struggle and we looked at the example of cheetah that is hunting impala and in that case the cheetah was not able to get its food. Now, after struggle for existence we have the survival of the fittest, only those individuals that are best able to obtain and use the resources will survive and reproduce. So, the, you have survival of the fittest. So, such as this. So, in this case the bird is able to survive because it is able to get the resources from the environment. And then because of survival of the fittest you have changes in the gene pool because those inherited characteristics they increase in frequency of favored traits in the population. So, in this case if this bird is able to get its food properly, so the offsprings will also have those genes that are enabling this bird to get its food in a proper manner. So, in that case uh, if you have some birds that are less fit, some birds that are more fit. So, the genes of the more fitter organisms they will increase in the gene pool and the genes of the less fit organisms they will decrease in the gene pool. So, that will lead to changes in the gene pool. And we looked at the peppered moth case study in which there was a change in the environment because of which these lichens died out. When the lichens die out, so before when you have the lichens you cannot see the lighter colored version you are only able to see the darker colored version and the darker colored version gets predated upon. When you do not have the lichens you have a darker colored bark in which case the lighter colored moth is visible the darker colored moth is, no, is more camouflaged. So, this one preferentially gets eaten. Once you again have the environmental loss you move back to this stage and again this one is at a loss and the lighter one is at a profit. So, in that case the because you have these variations because you have natural selection that is working. So, uh, this uh, uh, species was able to survive through all of these different stages. Then we looked at different kinds of selection. So, you have directional selection in which one particular uh, trait is preferred the other one is less preferred. You can have a stabilizing selection in which the central traits are preferred. So, if you have different colors and if this one is preferred and this is the current population. Uh, 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 the current frequency it will become even more um, centered. And then you have a disruptive selection in which the two ends are preferred and the middle ones are not preferred. Then we looked at examples of these directional selection as in the case of the size of beaks, stabilizing selection as in the case of the uh, birth of human baby at birth and the disruptive selection also in the case of Galapagos birds where the two ends were more selected. Then we also had a look at coevolution, the evolution of two or more species that interact closely with one another with each species adapting to the changes in the other. 
So, in this case you have this bee hummingbird and the flower. So, if there are changes in this flower, if this flower becomes long uh, becomes longer or more funnel shaped. So, in that case the bird of the beak will also be, uh, be it will also tend to evolve towards a more longer uh, beak length. So, that it is able to get the food. So, changes in one organism also lead to changes in another organism and a good example is the uh, trait of horns or the speed of carnivores or uh, the teeth of carnivores and so on. So, we looked at different examples and uh, it is important because ecological interactions are driving the evolution. Next in the second module we looked at ecological structure, the levels of organization, biodiversity and biodiversity in more detail. So, the levels of organization we began this with the story of these two people who are in tempers who are making watches and we came to the conclusion that those structures that are more organized they tend to be preferred. So, hierarchy emerges almost in inevitably through a, a wide variety of evolutionary processes for the simple reason that hierarchical structures are stable. So, because they are stable, so it, it tends to get uh, selected through the process of evolution. So, we looked at these hierarchical principles and you can see it everywhere in the case of a centipede you will have all these different blocks that have uh, these two legs. So, all these segments have uh, the same kind of structure and these segments are then repeated. Uh, and then we looked at the emergent principle the whole is greater than the sum of its parts or the whole has properties that the parts individually do not have. And then we looked at some emergent properties in the fire ants, some emergent properties in termite mounds and we looked at the levels of organization. So, we begin with the subcellular organelles. Now, subcellular organelles are specialized subunits within a cell that have a, uh, that have a specific function such as the nucleus of the cell. So, that is subcellular it is beneath, below the level of the cell and it is an organelle because it is a small organ in sense. Then you have cells that are the basic structural functional and biological unit of all known living organisms or the smallest unit of life. So, like in this case we are seeing the onion cell. Then tissue is an ensemble of similar cells and their extracellular matrix from the same origin that together carry out a specific function. So, in this case we are looking at the epidermis tissue that is made up of different cells and all of these cells have a similar structure, they have a similar origin, they have a similar function plus along with the cells you also have the extracellular matrix and the cells along with the extracellular matrix make up the tissue. Now, different tissues together make up an organ. So, it is a collection of tissues with similar functions uh, such as the intestine. So, it has different tissues. In our case, the intestines have the muscular tissue, they have epithelial tissue, they have blood vessels, they have nervous tissues and so on. Next, you have organ system which is a group of organs that work together to perform one or more functions such as the digestive system, the respiratory system, the reproductive system or uh, the excretory system and so on. Next organism is an individual entity that exhibits the properties of life. So, properties of life is that this organism is able to get its own food, this organism is able to reproduce and so on and this organism is able to respire and in the in a in the case of a number of organisms they are also able to move. So, these are the properties of life. Then organisms of the same group or species which live together in a particular geographical area and have the capability of interbreeding are known as population. So, here we have a population of cheetah. Then you combine populations of different species that are living together in the same geographical area at the same time and you get to a community. So, in the case of a community you will have in this case you will have a population of langurs, you have population of cheetahs, you have populations of grasses populations of different species of trees and all together they form a community. Now, to the community you add the abiotic components and you get the ecosystem. So, a community made up of living organisms and non-living components such as air, water and mineral soil all together it will form the ecosystem. So, you have the air, you have the soil, you have the water and all of these are regulating the communities and the communities are also regulating these abiotic factors. So, for instance, if you do not have water here, 
you will not have the animals here and because you have the animals here, so that is also bringing in some changes in the water because the animals are drinking away water, they are taking water from this area to another area. They are, they are probably disturbing the bed of this particular lake. So, when you have all these changes, the abiotic and the biotic components, they are influencing each other and they are responsible for each other and in this case we have the ecosystem. Then biome is a community of plants and animals that have common characteristics for the environment they exist in. So, an example is the uh, your tundra biome. So, in the case of a, of a tundra biome, you will have lots of ice and the vegetation will be very similar. Whether we talk about a tundra in Asia, a tundra in Europe or a tundra in North America, all of them will be having vegetation that has very similar characteristics or a desert biome. So, whether you talk about a desert in North America, a desert in South America, a desert in Africa, a desert in Asia, a desert in Australia, all of them will be having vegetation that has very similar characteristics. And from biome, we move on to biosphere, which is the top level of organization, the worldwide sum of all the ecosystems, which is uh, all the all the all the the living organisms that are living in on the planet earth. So, that is the biosphere or a combination of the lithosphere, hydrosphere and atmosphere which is supporting the life. So, to sum up you have subcellular organelles, then cell, tissue, organ, organ system, organism, population, community, ecosystem, biome and biosphere. Next we looked at biodiversity. So, we looked at different things that we are seeing in a forest and all these different organisms are examples of biodiversity. So, we define biodiversity as the variety of life in all its forms and all the levels of organization. So, when we say all its forms, we have plants, animals, vertebrates, in, invertebrates, fungi, bacteria, microorganisms, everything put together is biodiversity and all, all different levels. So, you have diversity at the level of genes, at the level of species, at the level of ecosystems. Then we defined uh, species biodiversity as how many species are there and how are they distributed. Similarly, we talked about genetic biodiversity and uh, in genetic biodiversity we talked about polymorphism and heterozygosity. So, polymorphism is the proportion or percentage of genes that are polymorphic. So, a gene is polymorphic if the frequency of the most common allele is less than some arbitrary threshold typically 95 percent. So, if the frequency is more than 95 percent. So, more than 95 percent of uh, all the alleles that are there in this particular gene pool are of this particular variety and in that case we will say that it is not polymorphic, it is monomorphic. Then we lo looked at heterozygosity, heterozygosity is the population of percentage of genes at which the average individual is heterozygous. Then ecosystem biodiversity is how many ecosystems are there and how are they distributed. Now, there are two measures of biodiversity species, especially uh, the species biodiversity. We can talk of a species richness and species evenness. Now, richness asks the question how many species are there, evenness asks the question how are the individuals uh, of different species distributed. So, do we have one species that has the maximum number of individuals? or a number of species each having roughly equal number of individuals. If you have a number of species that have roughly equal number of individuals, then we will say that the amount of evenness is much more. Then we talked about the species accumulation curve. So, in this case the, the total number of species that you have discovered in any area, it goes on increasing with time, but then after all it will start becoming flatter and we will say that this is the total number of species that we have in our particular area. Now, measures of biodiversity, we have Simpson's index and Shannon index. So, we looked at their formulae, we looked at how they are used and then we talked about alpha, beta and gamma biodiversity. Alpha biodiversity is the diversity that exists within an ecosystem, beta is that exists among different ecosystems and gamma is uh, the, the diversity that exists amongst different geographies. So, in this case, we talked about alpha. So, we took this example of lizards. So, in this case the alpha biodiversity in this particular ecosystem is 2, here it is 1. If you look at the beta biodiversity, so here you have two species that are not found in this ecosystem, here you have one species that is not found in this 
ecosystem this ecosystem and then we looked at gamma biodiversity we had we have three species that are not found in this island and we, we have one species that is not found in this island and whenever we are uh, working to increase biodiversity we have to look at all these three levels separately because if you drain out this particular swamp and if you replace this area with this area so you will have these two species at this place as well when once you have drained out the swamp and you have grown this forest but in that case this particular species will be lost because its habitat is now gone and in that case you will be increasing the alpha biodiversity at the cost of the beta biodiversity next we looked at biodiversity and spatial scale that is the hot spots these are the areas with a high species richness high level of endemism and high degree of threat and these are the areas that we tend to protect the most next we had a look at uh, why do some areas have more biodiversity and some have less biodiversity so there is this hypothesis evolutionary speed hy uh, hypothesis that if you have an area that has gotten more time to evolve so it is an old area and it has been uh, having evolution for a very long period of time or an area that has been having a very rapid evolution because the generation times are shorter there is a higher mutation rate or the natural selection is acting very quickly so in that case we will be having more amount of biodiversity the second hypothesis is that if you have an area that is larger in size so it will have larger areas and physically and biologically more complex habitats so these will support more niches or more roles for organisms and so you will have more, more of different kinds of organisms then third was interspecific interactions hypothesis if you have competition and if you have predation in an area so in that case your uh, biodiversity will tend to be more then you have the ambient energy hypothesis there is more biodiversity in areas with more energy because if you look at areas with very few uh, with very less energy such as our polar regions so uh, it cannot support a very wide variety of organisms and so the biodiversity in polar areas will be less then we have the fifth hypothesis which is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis if there is an area that has a very high uh, disturbance so there will be lots of extinctions if there is, are very less uh, or number of disturbances or very less quantum of disturbance so it will lead to an equilibrium and loss of species of low competitive ability so both of these extremes are not good if you have an area that has an intermediate level of bio uh, level of disturbance then probably it will have more amount of biodiversity then we looked at the economic value of biodiversity so this is the chart total economic value is a combination of use value and non use value use value is of three kinds direct indirect and option non use value is also of three kinds existence altruistic and bequest value so if you want to uh, quantify uh, or put a monetary value to the biodiversity of any place you can go with all these six different kinds of biodiversity add them together and you get the total economic value of biodiversity so we looked at different definitions use value non use value then direct value indirect value option value existence value altruistic value and bequest value now we we'll, uh, then we looked at the methods of valuation so you can have market price method or revealed willingness to pay so in this case people are actually paying for different things and you are adding up the cost to get to the market prices then you have the circumstantial evidence or the imputed willingness to play to pay such as replacement cost or damage cost avoided so in this case we were asking the question that if you remove this biodiversity what will be the cost that will be involved to maintain the services that this particular biodiversity was giving to you and then if you compute the cost of that replacement or the cost of the foregone benefit then that is the imputed willingness and then the third method is the contingent valuation where you ask people uh, their opinions about how much they are willing to pay to uh, to conserve this particular biodiversity so we can have different methods of valuation next we looked at ecological interactions positive negative and behavioral ecology so in the case of positive interactions we first began with what are interactions so interactions are the effects that organisms in a community have on each other and these interactions are of two kinds 
we can have inter specific interactions and intra specific interactions. Intra is within, so intra specific is within a, a particular species or the effect that an organisms in a community have on the members of their own species. Inter specific interactions, so in this case inter is among and specific is species. So, so these are the interactions or the impacts or the effects that organisms in a community have on the members of species other than their own that is on a different species. Then uh, you can also classify the interactions as harmonious or inharmonious. So, in the case of a harmonious interaction, they are also called positive in ecological interactions where none of the participating organisms is harmed. So, the main principle is not benefit, but harm. So, if there is any harm to any of the participants, we say that it is an inharmonious interaction. If there is no harm to any of the participating organisms, then we call that it is a harmonious interaction. And then we looked at different interactions. Harmonious interactions include colonies and societies and uh, inharmonious interactions and uh, these are the intra specific interactions. So, intra specific and harmonious you have colonies and societies, intra specific and inharmonious you have intra specific competition and cannibalism. Then if you look at the harmonious interaction, uh, 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 when you look at the inter specific interactions, so inter specific and harmonious would be proto cooperation, mutualism and commensalism and inter specific and inharmonious that is negative which are acting between two or more species that includes inter specific competition, parasitism, predation and amensalism. Then we had this table in the case of competition both the organisms are harmed in the case of amensalism there is one organism that is neither harmed nor is benefited, but there is another organism that suffers a harm. In the case of exploitation, you uh, you have one organism that is benefited, you have another one that is harmed. In the case of neutralism, there is no gain or no loss to any of the organisms, but in most of the situations, uh, neutralism can further be, uh, be examined and in most of the situations, neutralism tends to uh, give rise to one of the other interactions. So, there are very few uh, examples of pure neutralism that we have uh, between different organisms. Then you have commensalism in which there is no harm or benefit to one organism, but one, the other one is benefited and you have mutualism in which both the organisms are benefited. And then we looked at different positive interactions, we, uh, we started with colonies, they are functional integrated aggregates that are formed by individuals of the same species. So, they look as one uh, one big size individual such as coral reef, filamentous algae or microbial colonies. So, these are what are the colonies. Then societies are interactions for the labor division and collaboration among individuals of the same species. So, in the case of, uh, of societies you have a division of labor and you have collaboration and good examples are beehives or ant uh, colonies, they are actually societies or you can have termite mounds or you can have wolf packs. So, these are examples of societies. Now, the next one is proto cooperation. Proto cooperation is an ecological interaction in which both the participants benefit, but which is not obligatory for their survival. So, when we say not obligatory for their survival, it means that even though both these organisms are getting a benefit, but then they can remain away from each other. It is not essential for their survival. And examples in this case are birds that are eating ectoparasites on the bodies of animals or cleaner fishes that clean up the bodies of other animals or hermit crabs and sea anemones. So, we looked at this example of the birds on giraffe. In this case, the ectoparasites that are on the body of the giraffe, they are being eaten up by the birds. So, the, so this giraffe is getting a benefit because the ectoparasite load is reducing and at the same time these birds are getting a benefit because they are getting a good source of food. But then it is proto cooperation because both of them can remain away from each other, it is not essential for their survival. We also looked at hippospas, sea anemones. Then we had a look at mutualism, it is an ecological interaction in which both the participants benefit and it is 
obligatory for the survival. So, it is essential for the survival, the organisms cannot live without it. And good examples are microbes that digest cellulose in the stomach of ruminants. So, in this case the ruminants are able to digest cellulose through the action of these microbes. So, the ruminants are getting food and these microbes are getting shelter as well as food. Another example is rhizomium in the root nodules of leguminous plants. So, these are the root, root nodules in soya bean. And then next one is commensalism. So, this is an ecological interaction where one organism benefits and the other one is neither benefited nor harmed. Example is bacteria and other microorganisms that live on the skin without being pathogenic or beneficial. So, in this case the organism that is harboring these bacteria is neither benefited nor is harmed but the bacteria are getting shelter, the bacteria are getting food, so they are getting benefit. And the second example is egrets that are that feed with the buffaloes and we saw this example when these buffaloes are feeding when they move, so there is movement of the grass blades because of which the insects move and when the insects move then they are very easily caught up by the egrets. So, in this case the egrets are getting a benefit, the buffaloes are neither getting a benefit nor are they harmed. So, in this case this is commensalism. Then we looked at negative interactions. Now, in the case of negative interactions we have competition. So, competition is the ecological interaction in which individuals explore the same ecological niche or their ecological niches partially coincide and therefore, competition for the same environmental resources takes place. So, in this case we have a situation where you have more than one organism that is vying for the same resources which is why they compete with each other. And here we have the types intra specific versus inter specific. So, again intra is within a species, inter is between two species. You can have exploitative competition or interference competition and you can also have apparent competition. So, we looked at penguins and black bugs that were fighting amongst each other and intra specific and inter specific is something that we have seen. In the case of exploitative competition, that is scramble competition, where the individuals are competing for the same limited resource. And interference competition is contest competition in which the individuals are depleting others resources by interferences such as aggressive displays or fighting. So, in the case of interference competition, the individuals are not using at the same, same resource, but even if they are not using, they are not allowing anybody else to use it at the same time. So, in exploitation organisms use up the resources directly, so that it is no longer available for use by others. In the case of interference, one organism prevents others from using the resources. So, it is not using it, but it is not allowing others to use it. In the case of exploitative competition, there is often no direct contact or conflict between the species or individuals in exploitation. And in the case of interference competition, there is a direct contact or conflict between the species or the individuals. Then uh, in the case of exploitative competition, the competitive ability is the rate at which one organism is using up the resources. In the case of uh, interference competition, it is the ability to interfere in or to put up aggressive displays or to put up fights. Then uh, exploitative competition can be modeled as affecting the carrying capacity and pure interference competition can be modeled as affecting the rate of increase per individual. For pure exploitative competition, the rate, the, the relation between the rate of change per individual of one species and the abundance of another is non-linear, whereas in the second case it is linear. So, we have seen this in the case of our equation where we were uh, governing these interactions. And then the examples are in the case of exploitative and intra specific. So, there is an organism that is overgrazing on a land that is shared by several individuals of the same species. So, you, you have a number of deer that are grazing together and in that case one individual if it is eating up the grass then that grass is not available for use of another individual. So, this is an exploitative intra specific competition. And in the case of inter specific competition, you can have a competition between say cows and buffaloes and deer that are grazing on the same field. Or the second example is uh, the canopy trees of several species that are com competing for the same available sunlight. So, if 
one is expanding itself so that it gets more amount of sun the others will not be able to get sunlight in that much amount so this is exploitative the individuals are exploiting the resources in the case of uh, interference competition uh, the intra specific is an animal that is showing territorial behavior to its con specifics or members of the same species and in the case of inter specific it is allelopathy <coughs> Now in the case of allelopathy, one organism is giving out some chemicals that is inhibiting or killing off the other organisms. Then we have apparent competition, it is an interaction between two prey species with a common predator. So, <coughs> a good example is that of chital and sambar. So, here you have chital and here you have sambar, and both are having a common predator which is tiger. Now, if the chital population increases, the tiger gets more amount of food, the tiger population increases. Now, this tiger is uh, eating up the cheetals and it is also eating up the sambars. So, essentially in this case, the sambar is getting uh, affected negatively because of an increase in the cheetal population. So, this is an example of apparent competition. So, it is an interaction between two prey species with a common predator. An increase in the population of one prey species in this case cheetal may lead to an increase in the abundance of the common predator that is tiger leading to a stronger predation pressure on the second prey species which is sambar. In this manner the two prey species have a relation of indirect competition between them mediated by the numerical response of the common predator species. And then you we have several different characteristics generally the predator is a food limited generalist species. So, it is food limited because of which if one uh, species increases in numbers it gets more amount of food and so this limitation is gone and it is able to increase the numbers. And it is a generalist species because it does not have a particular preference it is eating it is preying upon both these preys. Some prey species can act as uh, keystone species in the community. At times some prey species may even get excluded from the community through diffuse apparent competition. So, there are situations in which you can push a, a particular species towards a brink of extinction because the predator has increased in numbers. And while the prey trophic level as a whole gets regulated by the predator, each prey species is regulated by an ensemble of the predator along with the available resources. And other examples are grasses and plants through rodents or exotic shrubs and trees through the action of seed predators or insect host and parasitoid communities. And this is also a, a good way in which the invasive species are able to increase their numbers. So, apparent competition results in the reduction of the prey species equilibrium densities and growth rates and is a common phenomenon that is observed in several food webs. It helps us understand the dynamics of prey predator systems and provides insight into the top down regulation of food webs. It helps create positive feedback loops for invasive species enabling them to quickly colonize newer areas by negatively influencing the established species. Thus an understanding of the phenomenon is critical for the proper management. So, if you have an invasive species that is producing large number of fruits, large number of seeds, so in that case those seed predators that feed on this invasive species they will increase in number and then they will start eating up the seeds of other established vegetation as well because of which the established vegetation will go down in numbers making way for the invasive species to extend its territory. Then finally, we have cannibalism it is the act in which one individual of a species is consuming all or part of another individual of the same species as food. And good examples are black widow and praying mantis. Then we have parasitism, uh, an ecological interaction in which one organism lives at the expense of another, but at in most cases does not lead to its death. So, good examples are ectoparasites such as leech and endoparasites such as Plasmodium vivax, which leads to malaria. Then we looked at predation, an ecological interaction where one individual mutilates or kills another to get its food. So, this is predation the bird is predating on this particular centipede and we also have predatory plants such as the pitcher plant. And then we have amensalism it is an interaction where an organism inflicts harm to another organism without any cost or benefits received by itself. 
example trampling of grass due to movement of animals. So, in this case the grass is getting harmed, but the animal is not getting any benefit out of trampling the, the grass such as black bugs that are grazing. Next we had a look at behavioral ecology. So, behavioral ecology is the study of the evolutionary basis for animal behavior due to ecological pressures. It is the study of evolutionary basis of animal behavior. So, we are looking at not just the animal behavior, but also the evolutionary basis and we say that these evolutionary bases have a root in the ecological pressure. So, we also have a look at the pressures that are there. Then we define behavior as the ways that organisms respond to each other and to particular cues in the environment and ethology is the scientific study of animal behavior. Some things that we study here are foraging behavior, anti-predator behavior, social behavior, mating behavior and so on. Now, we looked at the cost benefit approach. So, uh, this uh, approach says that uh, we need to make an assessment to determine whether the cost of an activity is less than the benefit. Uh, if the cost is less, the benefit is more, so the, the organism will go for that particular activity. We looked at examples of why do lions live in groups, what are the cost and benefit to the male and the female. Then we looked at why herbivores live in groups such as wolves that are hunting on bison. So, as long as these herbivores are together, the wolves are not able to hunt them, but as soon as they come out of a group, as soon as one individual is left out. So, in that case the wolves are able to prey upon it. Next we looked at the potential benefits and cost of group, group living animals. So, the benefits are increased foraging capacity, the cost is competition for food, increased risk of diseases or parasites. The potential benefit is reduced predation, but then the potential cost is that it leads to attraction of predators because you have more amount of food that is available in the form of this particular species. It leads to an increased access to mates because all the animals are together, but it leads to loss of paternity and, bo and brood parasitism. Then there is help from kin that is available, but it also leads to loss of individual reproduction. Then we looked at langur cheetal association, both these animals come together. Now, the langur is having a more of an advantage. So, in the summer seasons, it is having access to the food that is growing on the trees and when it is feeding it eats the, the petioles and throws out the other parts of the leaves. Some fruits also come down and in that case the cheetal are able to feed on that food. At the same time the langur is also at a more vantage position, so it can have a lookout for the predators and then when it gives out a warning call, when it gives out an alarm call, the cheetal also uh, get to hear that alarm call and they are also alarmed. On the other hand, if there is some predator that has been missed by the langur, but these cheetal are able to smell that predator, so they will also give out an alarm call and so the langurs will also get some benefit. But in this case, the benefit is not equally shared between both of these. So, the langurs have uh, are doing much more, but the cheetals are getting much, bit, uh, much larger amount of benefit as compared to the langurs. So, it is an example of asymmetric mutualism or asymmetric uh, proto cooperation. Now, uh, we also looked at the example of sacrifice for the group such as altruism in the ground squirrel and we look, looked at uh, when a particular organism calls, it depends on how many individuals in that colony are genetically related to itself and then we looked at the concept of kin selection which is the evolution of trait that increase the survival and ultimately the reproductive success of one's relatives. And group selection is the natural selection for traits that favor groups rather than individuals because group selection operates much more slowly than, it, than individual selection. It is a much weaker selective force in most circumstances, but in the case of kin selection, it, it has worked to a large extent. So, we had here the Hamilton's rule genes increase in frequency where r into b is greater than c, where r is the genetic relatedness, b is the additional benefit that is gone and uh, c is the reproductive cost to the organism or the individual that is performing the act. And then uh, we have Halden's statement, if an individual loses its life to save two siblings or four nephews or eight cousins, then it is a fair deal in terms of uh, evolution as siblings are on average 50 percent identical by descent nephews are 25 percent identical by descent and cousins are 
12.5 percent identical by descent. So, if an organism is saving its uh, is giving up its life to save more than two siblings, if it is saving three siblings, then evolutionarily that particular trait will be considered a, of a trait that is worth selecting for. Then we looked at the example of territoriality. It is a type of intraspecific or interspecific competition that results from the behavioral exclusion of others from a specific space that is defended as a territory. So, here we have a, a definite space that is actively defended and it aims at excluding the conspecifics or occasionally animals of other species from certain areas through the use of auditory, visual or olfactory signals as well as ritualized displays such as these tigers that are fighting. We also looked at penguins that are fighting for the territory, black bugs that are fighting for mates and then we looked at the cost and benefit for the territorial behavior. The cost is that it requires more amount of energy, there is more demand on time, there is more risk of predation, but then the benefit is that once you have devoted all of these, then you have exclusive access to the resources because there is nobody else that you have to share your resources with. Once it is established, then the territory actually reduces competition because the other animal stays away and it also regulates the size of the population. Then uh, we looked at whether this behavior is regulated by the environment or not and we came to the conclusion that yes, it is regulated by the behavior by the environment because if you have more amount of food, the territory size tends to decrease. And then uh, we looked at how do we study these behaviors, we can have a look at the activity patterns. So, in the case of uh, carnivores and herbivores, their activity patterns will not match very well, whereas in the case of, uh, of organisms that are not quite related such as two carnivores, their activity patterns will match very well or may match, match very well. And then we looked at ethograms, which are uh, which is an inventory of behaviors that are exhibited by an animal during a behavioral exercise. Uh, in the case of ethograms, we begin with a description of the site, define the behaviors, do scan sampling and focal animal study and then do a time budget analysis. So, we looked at the making of this ethogram that we did in Sariska. So, we described the site and the setting. So, in this case you have a water body, you have some trees here, you have this elevated road and here you have a particular population of the deer or the cheetahs. And then we define different acts, what is sitting, what is standing, what is walking, looking, feeding and so on. So, that every, uh, every person who is having a look at your ethogram should be able to understand what exactly each and every of these activity means, such as auto grooming is scratching or licking some part of one's own body. So, you are grooming yourself, allo grooming is you are grooming somebody else, scratching or licking part of somebody else's body. Then we looked at two methods, which is scan sampling and focal animal study. In the case of scan sampling, you move from, uh, from one organism to the next with every particular time period. So, here you start at 1455, look at what first one is doing, what second is doing, what third is doing, fourth, fifth, sixth and then you started at 1455, you end at 1456. Next you start at 1457, do it again, reach to this point, next you do it again. So, in this case you are looking at one animal at a time and you are looking at the whole of the group. In the case of focal animal study, you look at only one individual. So, you can do both these kinds of analysis and then come up with the time budget table, how much amount of time is spent by different individuals in different activities. Then it can be put up in the form of a graph, showing it in seconds or percentage or pie charts and through this we can make out the observations. So, uh, such as in this case, the dominant behavior are feeding, walking and looking, juveniles spend less time looking at adults and, and sub adults. So, it is possible that you are having some amount of parental protection or some amount of, of protection that is being afforded by the group because of which the juveniles have to spend less time looking out for the predators. Then you have sub adult male spend considerable time in auto grooming. So, probably they are, uh, uh, they are uh, trying to establish themselves for the next phase of life. So, in this way, ethograms and time budget analysis can help us record and understand the behaviors which has very important implications for ecology. So, that is all for the first part of the revision and tomorrow we will have a look at the second part of the revision. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.